Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Kun Fan. I'm a member of the China International Business and Economic Law Center and Associate Professor at UNET FLU Law and Justice. I'm very delighted to welcome you all to the 2023 CIBO and CIDRA Joint Conference on Dispute Resolution in the Belt and Road Initiative, a new model of economic governance. So I'll begin today by acknowledging the traditional custody of the land on which we meet today. So UNSW stands at the Badaga and Gardigo people. I want to pay my respect of the elders past, present and emerging. I also want to extend my respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present with us today. China is promoting a new model of transnational economic governance through the Belt and Road Initiative, a high-level policy framework shaping China's outward economic activities. China's modes of governance under the BRI reflect some extent of complexity and sometimes internal inconsistencies. So China is both taking an increasingly strong position in the existing international governance institutions, as well as finding new ways of governing and influencing through other channels. In this resolution, we see China aims to play a more important role through its pragmatic and flexible approach, the use of soft power and informalism, China is developing a model that offers perhaps alternative to the US-led model. On the other hand, China also appeared to be taking a more legalized approach, not only by further its own participation in those established dispute resolution mechanisms, such as through its active participation in the ISDS reform participations, while also building its own dispute settlement institution, including the, CA, the China International Commercial Court, leading to the establishment of the plurilateral dispute resolution forum, like the International Commercial Dispute Prevention and Settlement Organization. So what are the implications of those developments for international dispute resolution regime and international economic order more generally? I'm very pleased to have us with us today a panel of excellent scholars whose scholarship I really admire and enjoy reading to sit together uh, to explore those various issues surrounding China's dispute resolution approach and its implications for the economic order. So I will introduce the speakers um, just before they speak and each speaker will speak around 14, uh, 15 minutes and then in the end, we'll have some questions for the Q&A. So if you have any question, you can also put it in the Q&A function, and then we will try to address as many questions as we could in the end. Now I'll start by introducing our first speaker, Assistant Professor Mark Mycolin, Global Visiting Assistant, Assistant Professor at Singapore Management University and CEDRA. Mark's research focuses on dispute resolution, the Belt and Road Initiative, and international economic law. He has published articles and book chapters on China's approach to investor state arbitration, interaction between state owned enterprises and investment law, and also investor state mediation. So he holds LLB from University of Glasgow and a PhD from China University of Political Science and Law, where he was lecturer in international investment law. He was also awarded a Chinese government scholarship. So Mark will present to us today on the topic of investor state mediation and also China's foreign investment complaint system. So Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. So as was mentioned, what I'm going to talk about today is um, China and investment mediation. So the mediation of investor state uh, disputes and then how that might dovetail with a new investments complaints handling mechanism that has been introduced in China since 2020. Uh, and with that, can I have my next slide, please? So as a necessary uh, background, I want to talk a little bit about the emerging legal infrastructure of investor state mediation. Now, the interest in investor state mediation has really come out of 
a dissatisfaction with investor state arbitration and investor state dispute settlement generally, dissatisfaction with how it's working, both how um, long cases tend to take. So I believe the average for an exit case is three years um, to get to a, a final award and then a further two years if one of the parties seeks annulment. You also have a system that is very expensive in, in investor state arbitration and that also is quite acrimonious in terms of um, the the uh, exchange of briefs and is becoming more and more complex um, as cases go on. So really the interest in investor state mediation comes from that dissatisfaction, the dissatisfaction with investor state arbitration. And so Unsocial Working Group 3, um, which is established um, to discuss dispute settlement reform, um, has really been delving into these investor state mediation issues. So they have created draft provisions for mediation for inclusion uh, in investment treaties. They have been discussing draft guidelines for mediation and a draft legislative guide for investment dispute prevention and mitigation, which has um, a quite a significant mediation element to it. So really within the discussion of investor state dispute settlement reform, will you have, for example, the European Union and their institutionalization um, and their investment court, you also have another poll which is pushing uh, and proposing a more mediation and more consent based model. And so mediation is becoming uh, more and more prominent within Working Group 3 and is really the focus at the moment um, of the discussions at Working Group 3. But aside from Working Group 3, you also have considerable support from investor state mediation from other um, international institutions that have traditionally been involved in investor state disputes. So ICSID introduced their mediation rules in the past couple of years. The Secretariat of the Energy Charter Treaty introduced a guide on investment mediation, which I believe has become, I think, the most downloaded, um, most downloaded document on, on the ECT website. And also the Singapore Convention on Mediation, which made mediation, which made mediated settlement agreements kind of sui generis uh, enforceable legal instruments, um, has bolstered interest um, in this area of investor state disputes, the use of mediation to settle investor state disputes, which is of course the use of a, an impartial third party um, to facilitate negotiations between an investor and the state. Within um, investment treaties, you're seeing an increasing incidence of the use of mediation, uh, the inclusion of mediation in investor state disputes. Um, you see it particularly in recent European Union um, investment treaties, really very detailed provisions um, on mediation, laying out both kind of selection of mediators, processes, and I believe our moderator has a very excellent paper on um, the um, on the use of mediation uh, within investment treaties. And so the the international legal infrastructure of investor state mediation um, is really been growing um, over the past few years. So that's a necessary background. Next slide, please. So when it comes to China's approach um, to investor state uh, dispute settlement generally, I would describe it as one of selective engagement. So you have, on the one hand, within investment treaties, almost all of China's recent investment treaties have arbitration in them. And yet there is uh, a lack of activity and their use by Chinese parties. Now, that may be changing. I think in the past few years, there have been more cases filed um, than, than in the previous few. But nevertheless, you still see this kind of disequilibrium on the one hand with a, a considerable number of investment treaties with arbitration in them, and yet seemingly uh, a refusal to use them or a kind of disinclination to use them um, by Chinese parties. And so the question is, to what extent um, would China favour an investor state mediation system? And the answer to that is fairly straightforward because China's submission to Answer to Working Group 3, and I've, I've included a small quote from it there, um, really is in favour of the use of mediation. So the, the term used here is conciliation. These are considered to be interchangeable. And what the Chinese submission said is that investment conciliation emphasises the value of harmony, uh, allows a high degree of flexibility, is, has forward looking methods and avoids lengthy arbitration processes and high litigation costs. In fact, the full submission goes even further, talks about the preservation of business relationships. And when you talk about the success of mediation in the commercial sphere, those are the kind of things that you hear from parties. So at Sidra, we do a survey where we ask users of these dispute resolution systems, which um, and why they choose one system over another. 
so they choose mediation, for example, to preserve their business relationship because it lowers costs because it's faster. All of these very practical benefits um, which you see in the commercial sphere, which may be applicable in the investor state sphere. Now, there are some complications with um, the introduction of mediation in an investor state space. So some of the um, incentives that exist in the commercial sphere don't necessarily exist to the same extent um, in the investor state space. For example, when it comes to saving time or saving costs, that may be less um, important to an official than it would be to a director of a company. So the, while these advantages still exist, they don't, they aren't, don't necessarily transfer wholesale. However, in the um, mainland Hong Kong a close economic partnership agreement, you have very detailed provisions on mediation, allowing Hong Kong investors to seek mediation in China and to seek, and for mainland investors to seek, seek mediation in Hong Kong. And there is quite a detailed um, uh, level of provision for kind of what the procedure is, how you select a mediator, and CTAC um, has been very involved in that process. Next slide, please. So that brings me on to China's system of complaints handling. Now, on October 1st, uh, 2020, the rules on handling complaints of foreign invested enterprises entered into force. And what it does is create a system of complaint centers around China, mostly local agencies handling complaints, but also a national complaint center to which um, investors can submit complaints about legislative or administrative decisions taken in China. And so I've given a, 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 a kind of brief outline um, in, that, in that small diagram there. So once you um, submit um, your complaint, if it's related to the state council or provincial government or autonomous regions, it will go to the National Complaint Centre. If it has significant national or international impact, it will also go to the National Complaint Centre. And if it's more about local complaints, then it will go um, to those local agencies. What's interesting is um, about the system is it's very state led. It's a hierarchical state led uh, structure. And so to that extent, it's kind of, you know, investment mediation with Chinese characteristics, right? So throughout um, the rules on handling complaints on foreign invested enterprises, there is no express mention of mediation and there is no express mention of conciliation. And so I should say that um, at the outset. However, the language used um, throughout the rules is indicative of a mediation type process in my view and I'm going to give you a few examples of that uh, in a quick minute but I want to highlight just at the beginning just how quite state-led the structure is. Normally when we're discussing investor state mediation you're talking about maybe exit administering um, an investor state mediation or you know uh, SIAC or the ICC or any of these dispute settlement bodies administering mediation but here it's a very state-led structure and so the question becomes to what extent would parties be happy with that structure next slide please so there are mediation like elements in these specific rules and what's interesting is that there are the internal logic clearly recognizes three entities so when you're talking about the perspective of public international law all of the instruments of the state are the state, right? So when you have multiple agencies, both of those are the state for the purposes of public international law. So you have an investor and you have the state, only two parties. However, within the, in, the internal logic um, of these rules, there are clearly three entities. One is the investor, the other is the agency being complained against, and then thirdly, you have the complaint agency. So you have within the internal logic of the rules, three very clear entities and not two, as you would expect in a normal investor state dispute, right? When we talk about the rules of attribution, you're talking about, you know, the fact that the behaviour of a policeman and the behaviour of the president is for the purposes of public international law, both attributable to the state. So you only have one state. But actually, in practice, states tend, tend to be much more nuanced than that. Um, and I think the uh, rules like these and the kind of ombudsman systems that exist elsewhere um, really recognise uh, that more nuanced setup. So within the rules, it says that these agencies, complaints agencies may organise meetings. They invite the complainant and the complainant to state their opinions and discuss possible solutions to the complaint matter. The rules reference a settlement agreement. They reference the need to promote mutual understanding. And they have, within the logic of the rules, no express authority 
to impose a settlement. Now, you still have some questions, for example, about levels of impartiality. To what extent can a state agency really mediate a dispute when they, either the officials or the agency itself may have some kind of stake in the outcome? Of that dispute. So you do maintain some issues of impartiality and when you're talking about definitions of mediation, um, it may be the case that in certain jurisdictions that require, for example, a third person or require impartiality uh, in law, as in not the same particular entity, then it may be the case that some uh, jurisdictions would exclude this type of process from mediation. But for things like the Singapore Convention, for example, um, it's a very broad scope as to what you would define mediation as. And so in my paper, I go into much more detail about the extent to which um, settlement agreements reached through this process may be considered a mediation type process. So next, next slide, please. And so there are three really uh, enduring questions and I'll wrap up, I'll wrap up with these three. Firstly, um, will foreign investors use the system? Now, um, there is a similar system, a Korea, and in Korea there's an ombudsman system where they have um, a system for investors to submit complaints as to um, legislative, legislative decisions or administrative decisions about their investors, and they take on about 350 um, complaints a year. Not all of those would be escalated to investor state disputes, maybe a very small number would be, but it does indicate that you have some um, there's certainly a market for this type, this type of dispute settlement. Um, it will remain to be the case that it will depend on how this uh, system actually operates. To what extent are these national complaint centres actually facilitated um, in resolving dispute settlements? So really, and I can find no at the moment, either in English or in Chinese, any actual um, evidence of its work, of the work of these complaint centres so far. So it will really depend um, on the next few years and how um, the activity of these centres develop. Secondly, I think you might see a greater role for CTAC and other foreign related dispute settlement institutions in China. My instinct is that um, foreign parties would be much more comfortable dealing with dispute settlement institutions, as much as is contained in the um, China Hong Kong SEPA uh, agreement and the inclusion of CTAC might help bolster um, the credibility of the system. And finally, that there are some small gaps uh, in the rules here. So even though I have language and I've picked out language that is mediation like in these rules, if you, they are adopting a mediation type process, there are rules that they can learn from. So the ICSID rules on mediation, for example, or the IBA rules um, on mediation. And so those are the three enduring questions. Really, the most important one is whether foreign investors will actually use the system. I've not seen much promoted um, about it, but within the rules, there are provisions that state that the National Complaint Centre will promote the use um, of complaint centres as an alternative to adjudicative mechanisms. And I think that really um, ties back to what I said in the beginning about China's approach um, to investor state mediation. So just if I can briefly wrap up on that point, that although there is no express mention of mediation in these rules, it seems to me that the system being established is very mediation-like and would be consistent um, with China's approach to investor state mediation um, in Working Group 3. Uh, and with that, I'll bring my, my comments to an end. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Mark, for the uh, very insightful re remarks on investor state mediation and also um, those sort of state-led mediation-like complaint centers. As you said, it remained to be seen, you know, whether those foreign investors will actually use those complaint centers, um, especially in light of, you know, some issues perhaps with perceived impartiality. Um, so we might come back to that point, and I might also briefly mention that in my presentation. So we'll come back to that in the discussion, hopefully later. And now I would like to move on to our next speaker, Professor Mark Fettman. Um, Mark Fettman is Professor of Law at Peking University um, School of Transnational Law. He has previously served as a member of the T20 Saudi Arabia Tax Force on Trade, Investment and Growth, and as a member of the E15 Initiative Tax Force on Investment Policy, and also as a Chief of NAFTA um, CAFTA dispute resolution arbitration in the office of the legal advisor for the um, U.S. Department of State. His government experience also includes services as a law clerk 
to Judge Eric Clay on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, and also as a Peace Corps volunteer in um, Lesotho during South American transition to democracy. In the private sector, he has also practiced law for several years at Covington and Berlin. So we're very pleased today to have Mark with us, and he will talk about development of the Beijing-based International Investment Dispute Hub. Uh, thanks so much for the kind introduction, Professor Kun Fan, and, and also to uh, Siebel and Sidra for the opportunity. I, I really appreciate this, and it's a terrific panel. Looking forward to the discussion. For, for my talk today, I'm going to focus on two Beijing-based institutions, the, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, and, and the newly formed ICD PASO, which is the International Commercial Dispute Prevention and Settlement Organization, and, and thinking about how these two organizations in particular might be able to contribute to the development of uh, a Beijing-based investment dispute uh, resolution hub. Uh, I'll make a few introductory points on BRI, BRI Dispute Resolution, as well as how these two organizations relate to BRI, and, and then offer thoughts on potential for investment dispute uh, resolution. So the, if we could have the, the next slide, uh, please. Uh, in, in terms of the, the two organizations, both have been relatively recently established, the AIB in 2015, uh, ICD PASO in 2020. Each has in its own form global uh, membership, one important distinction, and particularly important for my talk today, is that ICD PASO already is focused on dispute resolution. Um, they, they plan to provide integrated services of mediation, arbitration, uh, is, including both commercial and investment arbitration services. The AIB, as a multilateral development bank, has not yet moved into the dispute resolution space. But for my talk today, I do want to offer some thoughts on the potential for the AIB to move into dispute resolution, not unlike the decision of the World Bank uh, roughly 55 years ago to also move into uh, dispute resolution in developing the, the ICSID convention and the establishment of ICSID. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a few initial thoughts on BRI generally. This is from a, a key early BRI document uh, from 2015. And uh, the document really sets out the, the basic vision of the Belt and Road Initiative. And I have on the slide what I consider to be a, a brief paragraph that I think really captures the core vision of BRI. And, and you'll notice that in this paragraph, the word connectivity appears three different times. Um, so connectivity clearly is, is very important for the Belt and Road. It can be understood obviously as, as infrastructure connectivity, but also more generally uh, digital connectivity. Uh, and, and then also thinking about rule harmonization. And uh, in, in a moment, I'll just discover uh, discuss briefly work that I've done in developing what I call dispute resolution connectivity, the way that dispute resolution can play a role in advancing the connectivity that really is at the core of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, in, in terms of connections between BRI and international dispute resolution, in 2015, when the initial vision for BRI was really being developed, there was not yet a real focus on how dispute resolution might be able to support BRI. But that vision was provided later, specifically in 2018. So here you can see some key points that I've taken from a 2018 opinion, uh, setting out the establishment of the Belt and Road International Commercial Dispute Resolution Mechanism and Institutions. And, and this 2018 opinion, it was really focused on the Supreme People's Court, the role of the SPC in establishing a China International Commercial Court with tribunals in Xi'an and Shenzhen. Uh, and, and the opinion as summarized by the, the SPC, by the Supreme People's Court, um, really highlights a number of key characteristics of BRI dispute resolution, the international character, the need for participation by experts in both international law as well as the, the domestic law of the respective BRI participating states, uh, fair and efficient dispute resolution, the role of party autonomy, including importantly party preferences for different kinds of dispute resolution, 
And, and what might be perhaps the most distinctive aspect of, of BRI dispute resolution, that being a, a creating diversified dispute resolution platforms, which integrate litigation, arbitration, and mediation services. So in 2018, we have this vision of how dispute resolution can support Belt and Road in the particular context of the SPC's establishment of a China International Commercial Court. But as I will discuss, when we think about other potential mechanisms that might relate to BRI disputes, the, these same considerations, these same principles can apply with equal force. Um, next slide, please. I, I had mentioned that in, in my own work, I've been developing uh, the idea of BRI dispute resolution connectivity, which, which recognizes that, that the BRI uh, includes not only physical infrastructure, but also legal infrastructure, which also can be uh, understood as uh, hard uh, connectivity and soft connectivity. Uh, and, and in terms of soft infrastructure, soft infrastructure includes legal infrastructure. And so various kinds of legal infrastructure can support BRI, uh, one example being rule harmonization, but an, another example of such soft infrastructure provided through legal infrastructure would be uh, various dispute resolution mechanisms. So by developing dispute resolution mechanisms that can support BRI, we are advancing uh, BRI soft connectivity and supporting uh, BRI in the process. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, with respect to the AIB's connection to BRI, that's actually been a topic of, of some uh, discussion. I, I think in the early days of AIB, uh, th there was uh, a wide perception that the AIB would actually be very closely related to BRI. Both were announced in the same year, 2013. They have the common goal of advancing infrastructure development in Asia. There is certainly substantial overlap between AIB membership and BRI participation. And that overlap was reinforced in particular one project in Oman involving a, a broadband network project was uh, co-financed by the Silk Road Fund. The Silk Road Fund is one of the key uh, sources of BRI funding. Uh, and, and so when you think about some of these initial uh, steps, these initial connections, it, it might appear that there's quite a close uh, connection between BRI and AIB. But on the other hand, there are a number of factors that make clear that the AIB exists quite independently of the Belt and Road Initiative. The, A the AIB frequently works with uh, multilateral development banks and co-financing arrangements, has shown a lot of flexibility uh, with respect to that practice. Notably, about one third of all AIB funding has been received by a state that is not participating in BRI, and that is India. Uh, I, I think the, the succinct way to describe the relationship is that the AIB finances projects that are both within and outside of jurisdictions uh, that are participating in the Belt and Road Initiative. And I think this was clearly summarized by the AIB president, uh, Jin Li Chun, who, who observed that we, meaning the AIB, we operate by our standards, by our governance. The Belt and Road Initiative is a marvelous program but we have our standards. And so I think that really does capture the, the relationship between the AIB and BRI. Uh, the next slide, please. In, in terms of the relationship between the ICD PASO and BRI, uh, here the relationship is clearer in the sense that the organization was actually established as one deliverable as part of the, the second Belt and Road Forum for international cooperation that was held in 2019. So as you can see that, that one deliverable under the category of multilateral cooperation mechanisms under the, the Belt and Road Forum framework was the creation of this ICD PASO organization with representation from more than 30 countries and regions in, involving a range of different organizations that are participating in the establishment of this uh, multilateral institution. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the ICD PASO's activities, their charter, uh, you can see that they will be, uh, they, they anticipate working on uh, a wide range of international commercial disputes, but also playing important roles in, in terms of capacity building, in terms of education, hosting conferences and seminars. And actually in the past few years, ICD PASO has been very active in, in um, organizing such conferences. 
in, in terms of their handling of disputes, it appears that still uh, they're still in really in the early stages. They in 2022, they sent out an announcement, a global announcement, seeking uh, arbitrators to serve a, in disputes that will be administered by the ICD uh, Paso. And I think that we could, what we can expect with ICD Paso, and actually not unlike what we can expect with the CICC, the China International Commercial Court, is is an overlap in terms of the the scope of their work. That some of their work certainly will include Belt and Road disputes, but the scope of their work extends beyond Belt and Road. And so when I think when we think about BRI, BRI dispute resolution, we can think about organizations like the CICC, like. ICD Paso, where some of their work is devoted to Belt and Road disputes, but clearly uh, a portion of their work will go beyond a, a BRI context. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, in, in terms of turning to investment dispute resolution and the role that the ICD Paso and the AIB might play, for ICD Paso, they, they clearly anticipate working on investor state disputes. They completed a draft set of rules in 2021. Uh, uh, they committed in late 2021 to uh, beginning in a timely manner uh, to launch uh, services for uh, investor state arbitration. And in 2022, as I mentioned, they launched a global recruitment uh, process for arbitrators. So now th the next step will be actually starting to work on concrete investor state cases. Uh, and, and on this point, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, that ICD Paso really needs to raise awareness in the global community that they are ready to work on these disputes. Um, perhaps one way to help raise that kind of awareness would be through treaty practice that, that in treaties normally investors will be provided with a range of options. For example, whether to submit a claim under UNCITRAL rules, under ICSID rules, and so going forward, one way that ICD Paso might uh, consider in terms of raising awareness of their services would be to see if, if their rules, uh, their form of arbitration might be made available through an express mention in uh, new investment treaties that might be developed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in, in terms of distinctive approaches that they might provide for investment treaty arbitration, I mentioned this in a recent essay uh, in the Columbia FDI Perspectives series. I, I think offering diversified dispute resolution, the integration of different services could be quite uh, distinctive. And also the possibility of greater levels of institutionalization and uh, importantly, regional diversity. And on regional diversity, the, the next slide, please. Um, I would, I would highlight recent numbers from ICSID on regional diversity that you can see the 46% and 20%, that is representation of arbitrators from North America and Western Europe. You see the 11% number, that uh, represents a region referred to as South and East Asia and the Pacific, but that region happens to include uh, Australia and New Zealand. So the representation from Asia in particular in ICSID cases, we can see is well under 11%. And, and so here there's a real opportunity to increase regional representation from Asia through the work of ICD Paso. Uh, the next slide, please. I, I realize that I only have a few minutes left. On the AIB, I, I would highlight that, as I mentioned, 55 years ago, the World Bank moved into the space of investment dispute resolution. I see a similar opportunity today for the AIB. Um, this idea certainly is being considered. It was mentioned in a chapter in the 2019 AIB Yearbook of International Law. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, going back to 1965 with ICSID, this is from the report of the executive directors, where ICSID saw a role for itself in advancing its mission of economic development through the development of an ICSID convention. You can see that the language of creating an atmosphere of mutual confidence. And, and so here the AIB, if it did want to go in this direction, could again look to create an atmosphere of mutual confidence that might uh, encourage investors to uh, engage in greater levels of investment and thereby advance economic development. And in terms of an atmosphere of mutual confidence, I would highlight again the importance of uh, regional representation, that if you have better representation from Asia among decision makers, that can contribute to such an atmosphere of mutual confidence. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
And in, in terms of how the AIB might go forward in this uh, direction, this again is from my, my recent essay in the Columbia FDI Perspective Series, where I highlight a number of different directions. Uh, notice, and this picks up from Professor McLaughlin's point on a, a, a kind of ombudsperson role, ombudsperson role that we see in mainland China, that we could see the AIB um, perhaps including a similar kind of mechanism, encouraging investment facilitation, encouraging dispute prevention. There is a lot of opportunity to look at developments over the past, say, 20 years, and to really build on those developments uh, with a, a new kind of exit convention that could also take on substance of obligations as well. I think I'll close with the final point on, on ICSID is one ICSID of limit, one limitation of the ICSID convention is that it does not include substantive obligations. This was a deliberate strategic choice made by the drafters that the instrument would be modest. I think the AIB in that sense has an opportunity to be less modest in the sense of considering uh, developing substantive obligations in an instrument and in particular could think about uh, issues of sustainability and, and how best to frame issues of sustainability as a Beijing uh, based multilateral development bank. I realize that I'm out of time, but I really do appreciate the opportunity again and, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Mark, for these excellent remarks. And it's very interesting of this uh, development of those uh, China-led institutions. And some also argue with this emphasis on dispute prevention, right? It might introduce an Asian way of resolving dispute or powerful transmitter of the Chinese alternative version. But it remains to be seen how um, attractive it is compared to other existing mechanisms. So we might come back um, during the discussions. And now I would like to move to our next speaker, um, Professor Matthew Airy. Um, Matthew is a member of the law faculty and associate professor of the modern Chinese studies in the Oriental Institute and associate research fellow of the Social Legal Studies Center at the University of Oxford. Professor Ayres' interdisciplinary work combines law and anthropology to expand the theoretical base and empirical border of comparative law with a particular focus on Asian law. Matthew previously held academic positions also at Princeton University and NYU Law School. He is now a visiting uh, scholar at National University of Singapore Law Faculty. He is also a co-chair of the American Society of International Law's Asian Pacific Interest Group. So we're very pleased to have Matthew with us today, and he will talk about the soft power of Chinese law. Matthew, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Kuhn. Really nice to be here. Thank you for having me. So we've heard some excellent reports on ISDS. I'm going to take us in a slightly different area in terms of international commercial arbitration with also a kind of social theory twist, so a little bit of different approach. And I think generally here, when we think about China's uh, outbound law related work, China right now is battling two, two fronts. One is uh, its relationship with the US and the allies of the US, and then the other is its relationship with the global south. And this talk is gonna focus more on the latter relationship. I'm gonna zoom out with a, a large sort of 30,000 foot perspective and then zoom in. Next slide, please. So by way of preview, I'm going to talk a little bit about the larger research project to give you some context. Then I'm going to present this particular uh, paper, which is derivative from the larger project, which has two aspects. One is analyzing China's approach to legal harmonization, particularly with the African states on the issue of international commercial arbitration, and then talk about sort of the theoretical takeaway. And then I'm going to address the larger sort of implications of the study. Next slide, please. This uh, paper is a product of the China Law and Development Project, which is based at the University of Oxford, and which I'm very fortunate to lead. It's a five-year research project, and we're really looking at the role of law in China's uh, global development at two levels. One is how Chinese actors are engaging with questions of international law, with a particular focus on uh, international investment law and, and, and trade law. Uh, and then the second level of analysis is how Chinese actors are engaging with challenging legal and regulatory environments in host states, mainly low-income and middle-income states in the so-called Global South. Next slide, please. 
So we're really at an interesting moment right now in terms of China's outbound law related work. So this is a, a, an image from the Brunswick Group's report. Uh, this is pre-COVID, but I think is very exemplary and probably this trend has been exacerbated over the course of COVID. So we can see in the left hand, uh, left -hand side here is uh, trust in Chinese companies uh, from <clears throat> the, the developing world and, and it's basically very high, 80% and increasing. And then on the right hand side, we have uh, trust uh, in Chinese companies from developed jurisdictions, and that's you know about half of the respondents, 51 percent, and decreasing. And I think this really is exemplary of this, this of the trends that we see. Next slide, please. So this is uh, focused more on the the developed countries. You can see this level of negative valuations of, of China, in particular Chinese companies operating their jurisdictions, and you can look at, across the the uh, the spectrum here uh, from Australia to Japan in terms of the increasing distrust and negative evaluation of, of China's uh, presence in, in their jurisdiction. Next slide, please. This can be contrasted with uh, African states. This is the Afrobarometer 2020, which gives us a sense in terms of how African states are viewing China. You can see China has the most positive assessments in terms of external influence in, in the region, even more so than uh, former Colonial power is even more so than the US, the, the, the UN, etc. Next slide, please. So one constant of, uh, of Chinese companies that are operating in the BRI context is the issue of high risk. So this is a, uh, a, a series of reports, a, a table generated from reports from the uh, China Institute of Corporate Legal Affairs, the Zhongguo Gongsu Fao Yuan Yuan, based in China. And, and, and the idea here is to assess how Chinese companies are regarding issues they're confronting in the course of their outbound related work. And you can see here in terms of the, uh, the row on risks that one of the common responses 2016 onward is the unstable legal system of host states, right? So this is a real concern in terms of their operations in doing business in those countries. Uh, next slide, please. So what we do in our projects is we're trying to assess a number of, of, of questions. One is how do Chinese uh, actors, in particular SOEs, but also the private companies, how do they protect their overseas investment? So that's a kind of descriptive question. The next question is a sort of analytical question, which is what is the role of law in, in the development projects more generally? And then third, the normative question, what are the effects in terms of what China is doing uh, in generating cross-border order? Next question, please. Sorry, next slide. Yeah. So in terms of the, the broader kind of uh, uh, placement in the literature, what we see is that generally, uh, you know, what we know about Chinese law and governance is very much from the kind of Anglo American Western European perspective. These are some uh, studies that sort of demonstrate that that point. And what we're trying to do is really diversify uh, what we know about Chinese law and governance, particularly given the, the current um, state of, of global affairs. Next next slide, please. So what we do is we work with uh, researchers all over the world. We have about 55 right now um, from Southeast Asia and the Pacific all the way to uh, uh, Latin America, Central Asia, uh, Africa and elsewhere who are generating empirical data on these questions of how Chinese actors are engaging with these uh, jurisdictions and vice versa, how local regulators and counterparties are also dealing with the new normal of more Chinese companies operating in their jurisdiction. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go into detail here, but we can see some comparisons between how uh, previous capital exporters, mainly the Anglo-American um, capital exporters, were dealing with issues of law and development versus how China is dealing with issues of law and development. And there are some uh, commonalities, but also some interesting uh, divergences as well. And uh, I know Kuna will be talking about informality, so that's one point to, to stress, but also this issue of network formation, which I think is very um distinctly Chinese. Next slide, please. Uh, also, uh, Chinese are uh, Chinese authorities are very much focused on uh, um, trying to uh, shape or nudge different aspects of international law. This is a, an important element of what's happening in terms of their bilateral relationships as well with uh, developing countries and uh, very interested in this this last category in the far right, which is the sort of the Tianyan or frontier areas of law where China may have a, a first comer advantage. And we may actually put in a dispute resolution in terms of China's innovations in this area in that category as well. Next slide, please. 
So in the project, we're looking at three kind of general analytical categories, the networks that China is producing, its practices in cross-border trade and investment, and also the institutions that it's forming. Next slide, please. So in terms of institutions, there's a broad array of institutions that China is engaging with, either established uh, uh, international, transnational institutions, or ones that it itself is, is forming. Uh, it also is, is as uh, Mark Feldman said, it's developing its own institutions domestically. What I'm gonna focus on is what China is doing uh, extraterritorially in terms of developing or co-organizing, co-founding institutions outside of the PRC. Next, next slide, please. So the, the particular institution that I want to focus on is the China-Africa Joint Arbitration Center. So, so what is this and, and what is it doing? Well, very briefly, I, I don't have time to go into all the details, but uh, the China-Africa Joint Arbitration Center, or KJAC for short, was established by the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation circa 2015 and established two centers, uh, one in Johannesburg in, in, in South Africa and the other uh, through uh, uh, the Shanghai International Arbitration Center in Shanghai, China. Uh, in 2017, uh, additional centers were added, the Nairobi Court of International Arbitration and um, one also in the OHADA system, which is the Francophone uh, African States system, and then also in China, BIAC, the Beijing International Arbitration Center, and SCIA, the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration, were also added. So basically what this means is there's a kind of network, if you will, of six uh, centers and there are plans to add more. The idea is essentially to pool resources, that is arbitrators and even arbitration systems to address disputes that arise in the course of Sino-African deals. And to quote some of the literature that has come out of KJAC, the idea is to establish, I'm quoting, establish a grand coordinated pattern for China-Africa joint dispute resolution, end, cool, end quote. And this is really riding a wave of discontent with established institutions, as the previous speakers mentioned, Cage Act is mainly for private parties, not ISDS, but um, it's also kind of riding this wave of, of criticism of the existing ISDS system and ICSID in particular uh, in African states and also in, in China. Next slide, please. So how does this work? How does how how has KJAC been formed and, and, and what does it do? So I, I see it as a kind of example of China's legal cooperation. And legal cooperation in the Chinese context operates through the building of transnational networks. So these are just a series of events, conferences, workshops that either um, uh, I have attended or members of the research team. And what we have here is legal cooperation as kind of overt public diplomacy, uh, but also there are examples of commercial law uh, involving private parties that are discussed um, uh, in these various events. Uh, who is engaging? on these uh, issues of legal cooperation. Well, it's the Supreme People's Court, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, MOFCOM, all China Lawyers Association, et cetera, et cetera. There's a number of institutions that are engaging with this across the spectrum in China. Uh, and as I said, it takes a number of different forms, including international conferences, but also trainings for foreign lawyers and foreign judges as well. The functions are to target specific issues, and also to broaden the knowledge of PRC law, to facilitate mutual recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments and awards, very important um, practical point, to help with judicial assistance, service of process, to help with referrals, uh, dealing with lo local legal issues, for example, in African countries, but also to disseminate information about legal developments in China. Smart courts is often discussed in these various forums. And let's not forget ideological commitments by Xi Jinping uh, uh, in terms of his thought on rule of law. Um, how do we view these? Well, there's a, a, a range of views. So some of the Chinese scholars would argue that these are exemplary of, quote, transnational judicial dialogues, repurposing some of the language from the uh, earlier generation of liberal uh, uh, internationalists. Other people would say, well, these are just kind of all expenses paid junkets to Beijing, and they don't really have any substantive value. And I'd say the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an example of, of soft power in action. So in the past uh, 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 waves of law and development, these were really exemplified by the, the US and the UK. They really rode on kind of the military strength of those countries. So China doesn't have that kind of hard power dimension in terms of military strength, but it does have hard power in terms of its economic might. And so the law story here really, I think, trails or follows you know, China's economic um, uh, weight and its, and its um, impact in, in smaller states. And we can see this exemplified in this quote. This is um, an interview with a Kenyan lawyer in terms of setting up 
the KJAC institution um, in, in, in that particular context. And really it's about sort of Chinese concerns about local jurisdictions, um, lack of, of familiarity, uh, sort of skepticism about the courts, and, and really trying to mitigate the legal costs. And, and all of these gave rise to this um, interest in developing their own international commercial arbitration center in the form of KJAC. And the lawyer, I think importantly, draws to the mm -hmm. fact that it was established by the Chinese government and large Chinese companies that were driving this. Next slide, please. Now, there are issues here in terms of using Chinese uh, arbitration law and Chinese uh, uh, international um, uh, arbitration commission institutional rules informing this new uh, uh, institution uh, outside of the PRC. And the reason for that is the, the Chinese approach to arbitration does have its own distinct features, which are somewhat um, anomalous so when we look at international commercial arbitration um, across the region, right? So the, on the one hand, there are some uh, advantages to Chinese arbitration very quickly, you know, it's a huge amount of support from the government. Uh, the government's very focused on enforcement and recognition of foreign awards. It's a very competitive market, which is, you know, the race to the top argument. It's generally fairly speedy and, and low cost and efficient. But as I said, there are these issues, right? So there are structural issues in terms of the relationship between international uh, commercial arbitration centers in China and the uh, local governments. There are still, unfortunately, ongoing issues of enforcement recognition. The uh, existing legislation is, is outdated, right? The 1984 arbitration law, it's not compliant with the Institutional Model Law on International Commercial Arbitration. There's no confidence confidence. There's not even the, the notion of the arbitral seat and there's no ad hoc arbitration. Uh, next slide, please. Now, there is, there is a, a, a number of amendments that are proposed to the 1994 arbitration law, which came out in 2021. Uh, we haven't yet seen these come through, but they do address a number of the issues. For example, the notion of the seat, uh, which I know Kuhn has written on this issue, uh, the issue of confidence, confidence, and also uh, allowing for ad hoc arbitration. However, fundamentally, uh, the new proposals don't address these structural issues. For example, the budgetary uh, relationship between the arbitration commissions and local governments. And I think those are still um, pressing issues. Next slide, please. So, so KJAC can be seen as an example of sort of legal harmonization in the context of international economic law, right? It's sort of trying to use the rules developed in, in, in China to apply them to this new institution outside of China. But there were issues with that, mainly because the, uh, the South African legislation is an UNCITRAL model law jurisdiction. China is not. There were problems. As a result of that, what the, uh, the founders of the institution did was they created a kind of bifurcated or two-tiered system of rules where you have the local rules, but then you have uniform rules. And oftentimes parties will opt out of the uniform rules when uh, there are conflicts uh, between the Chinese system and the local system in, in, in the African state, which basically means that it's, it, the uniform rules aren't doing that much. It's basically just deferring to the local, local rules. Next slide, please. So I'm winding down here, but I wanted to provide a little bit of a kind of social theory twist to the conversation. So this is an image I took doing actually my first research project in China back in 2008. This is an example of a Ding Zihu or a nail house in Beijing. This is during the uh, demolition of uh, sections of Beijing in advance of the Beijing Olympics. And what we see here in this context is we saw the Beijing government basically um, including lots of signs and statements about how law works in this context of demolition and relocation, what's called Chai Qian in China. Uh, house owners would also use this language and appropriate it to defend their property rights. And so what's happening here is a similar dynamic, I would say, in the course of KJAC, where, la next slide, please. We have this kind of uh, production of signs of legality, which is really pointing to a South-South relationship. But I would say fundamentally what's happening is KJAC is fulfilling a purpose of communicating the South-South solidarity rather than uh, functioning as an, uh, as an actual uh, dispute resolution mechanism. To date, KJAC has not received uh, many cases at all. So very last slide. So in conclusion, we can see that China, oh, nope, sorry, one before, you went too far. So in conclusion, we can see that China is trying to build these transnational legal institutions, yet there are existing pathologies which are kind of uh, spreading out as uh, the Chinese companies are going out, but also that come out with these institutions and then that are affecting the, uh, the construction of these institutions and how they operate. And I think KJAC, as I said, is really trying to uh, fulfill a communicative function in saying that China can play this role of creating these institutions, but to date, 
we don't really see much work being done. I argue this is an example of what I've called elsewhere China's legal surrealism. So we'll see what happens in the future. It may be the case that KJAC takes off, but to date we haven't yet seen much action. So I'll, I'll end there. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Matthew, for those excellent, um, interesting remarks. And indeed, the establishment of those, um, the CJAC is an interesting example that you illustrated and um, like a net work based uh, like institution and we'll see right, as you your question in the end whether it's more it will build into something more functional of accepting cases or is it more kind of symbolic um, like signaling this um, China's relationship and and I think our next speaker might also um, allude to this um, institution as well. So I'm very glad to now move on to our next speaker, um, Professor Wang Kidan. Uh, professor Kidan is a Fulbright Scholar and full professor of law at the Seattle University School of Law. He teaches and writes in the area of international arbitration, transnational litigation, international and comparative law, uh, investment law, and public law. Um, so before joining the Seattle University Law School in 2008, Professor Kidan also taught at um, Penn State Dickinson School of Law for three years and before joining academic, he has also practiced in the law firms in Washington, D.C., focusing on international arbitration and litigation. And he continued to practice in, in investment and commercial arbitration under a variety of rules, including essential ICC, LCIA, uh, PCA, etc. And he also served as an arbitrator and is on roster of arbitration in a number of arbitration institutions, including CITAC, HKIC, Cairo Regional Center of International Arbitration. So we're very pleased also to have Wang with us today, and he will talk about China, Africa, and dispute settlement. Wang, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Confan, uh, and I appreciate the invitation. I'd like to <coughs> um, begin by saying that uh, this outline might look very lengthy. Uh, I'll go over it very quickly and I try not to exceed uh, the allotted time. So uh, I'll go over trends in economic relations very quickly uh, in terms of China Africa trade, uh, investment uh, and commercial relations generally. And I also like to say a few words about what we know so far about China-Africa loan agreements and the dispute resolution mechanisms enshrined therein. Uh, and because Matthew has just talked about the uh, China-Africa Joint Arbitration Centers, I can uh, skip that part in the interest of time and talk a little bit about the theoretical underpinnings towards the very end. Um, and that's what I intend to do in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So as you can see here from um, uh, Johns Hopkins China Africa Research uh, Initiative, the trade between China and Africa grew up until 2015-2014 and it seemed to have picked there and then started declining up until 2020. And then something happened in 2021, and, and that's the post-COVID. Uh, it seems to be rebounding again. Um, that's what we have in terms of raw statistics. And let's go down to the next slide. In terms of dispute settlement relating to trade, primarily it's a, it's a WTO, uh, uh, 44 African states are members of WTO and China, of course, it is. So if a dispute arises directly, it could be dissolved under the DSO, D, D, dispute settlement understandings of uh, the WTO system. Uh, but obviously, there hasn't been any dispute between any uh, African country uh, or state in China so far. And that's essentially because almost nearly all African products get into China without any uh, uh, restrictions and without any tariffs. More than 97% of African products are actually uh, beneficiaries of unilateral concession. So 
it's not surprising that there is, there has there hasn't been any dispute trade dispute between any uh, African country and and China. But theoretically, if a dispute arises, that is the mechanism uh, for the resolution of that dispute in in trade. Let's go down. In terms of investment, we have at least 35 China Africa bits signed. 16 have come into effect. And interestingly, only four have been signed since 2010. And only one bit with African state came into effect in the last decade. So there is reduced bit activity between China and, 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 and Africa. So that trend is unmistakable. The most recent one is with Tanzania, and I don't want to go into the details of it. It has its own peculiar characteristics. Um, but again, the, the trend is towards not adding more uh, treaties. Uh, that's what it shows. So let's go down. In terms of the actual uh, inflow of FDI from China to, the, to, to um, Africa, and in comparison with U.S. investment in, in Africa. This is what you see. Um, obviously, uh, Chinese investment uh, is, you know, where it is right now. 2021, uh, there has been a significant jump since, since, since COVID and U.S. investment uh, declined significantly over the years. But there's been ups and downs, but this is what we have in terms of statistics again. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So uh, as far as we know, uh, there have only been a, a limited number of um, ISDS cases involving uh, China and Africa. Chinese companies have not been very active in pursuing ISDS against African states. There is uh, the the Ghana Africa case, exit case that we know of, and there's the uh, Nigeria, the Chinese company against Nigeria case that is currently pending before the, uh, the uh, DC Circuit Court of Appeals for enforcement. Uh, but uh, ISDS activity generally has been uh, extremely low as compared to the volume of investment that Chinese companies have uh, in Africa. Now, uh, it's interesting that there are now at least, I checked this very recently, there are 17 reported exit cases initiated by Chinese companies against states ranging from Sweden, Ecuador, Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, Ukraine, Greece, Nigeria. Um, and uh, there is a next slide that shows the trend. Let's go to, down to the so this is actually on the pending case. Um, it, it raises a, a significant jurisdictional issue in the United States. The, the one interesting thing is, this is the very first, as far as I know, the very first China-Africa case that is now being litigated in front uh, before a United States court. So the Nigerian uh, government attempted to get it annulled in England, they did not succeed. Uh, but uh, for different reasons, the Chinese investor uh, who won the award sought confirmation in a US court in the District of Columbia. The district court um, affirmed, at, well, the, well, ruled in favor of the investor and Nigeria appealed to the Circuit Court of Appeals, and it's primarily because the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act in the United States is an extremely complex statutory framework. Uh, you'd have to prove at, at least one exception to succeed in enforcement. So the arbitration exception is now being litigated uh, between this Chinese company uh, and, 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 uh, and Nigeria. So, but beyond that, uh, the, the appeal is still pending as far as I know. Beyond that, 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 that's, that I think there hasn't been any, any activity in the United States, and I don't believe there has been any in any developed uh, legal system. Uh, let's go down uh, to the next slide. Um, 
Um, before I, I say, before I go to the loan agreements, one of the observations that I had, it might be hidden in one of the slides. If you look at the 17 Chinese exit cases, I think at least 10 of them, by my counts, have been since 2020. So something interesting happened, and it, that's a, a more than you know 100% jump. Um, we don't know if that's indicative of a new trend uh, or it's just an aberration, but that's one observation that I've made from uh, from uh, the exit website. So trade and investment disputes have been extremely minimal between China and Africa. And when I wrote my book 10 years ago, 2011, on China-Africa dispute settlement, my own expectation was that there would be more China-Africa disputes than we've seen in the last decade or so. Um, I don't know what the explanation is that the number of disputes uh, haven't been too many, and some of them, my understanding is that they get diffused before they actually escalate into a formal uh, resolution. I'll say very briefly, my observations about the China-Africa loan instruments, loan agreements and their dispute settlement mechanisms and uh, uh, conclude quickly. So we know that there are uh, thousands, literally, of uh, loan agreements between African states uh, and Chinese uh, lenders. And we have had a chance to look at at least 100 of those that have, by some accident, been revealed uh, and that offered us some insight into what they look like. There, is, there have been all sorts of speculation about how China lends to Africa. A lot of uh, theories uh, that have been refuted by the disclosure of these, uh, these instruments. So some have observed already uh, that there are some peculiar characteristics. I don't know how peculiar they are, but there is confidentiality clauses that are not very surprising. Uh, but there is a little bit of collateral lending structure, seniority of the loans, and keeping them out of uh, you know collection restructuring such as the Paris Club and stabilization closes. There's, people have observed, and I also examined all of these instruments, and there are these peculiarities of sorts. I'll say a few more words in the next slide, please. So substantively, there are some, some differences, but not substantial. Um, in terms of the dispute settlement clauses, each one of them do contain, it does contain a dispute resolution clause, each one of these instruments, right? So there would be the usual waiver of sovereign immunity, inclusion of arbitration. Most of them, the great majority of them, select Chinese law as the governing law and CTAC as the administering institution. There are occasional loan instruments that actually select English law or even Ghanaian law at some point, I've seen, but the great majority of them, especially the Exim Bank, Chinese Exim Bank, uh, you, they use different models, but in all of those models, you see this recurring. Let's go down. I tried to compare these loan instruments with World Bank, ADA loan instruments. How, how do they compare? Are they extraordinary? How, how, how do they compare? Um, I've noticed a few, few differences. Uh, the most fundamental one is the choice of law. Uh, the World Bank instruments obviously select international law as the governing. And that's what they do. There's a reason for that. I'm not going to go into the details of it. And the loan instruments themselves are actually treated like any international treaty. Uh, and it's ad hoc arbitration, uh, men's power given to tribunals. And the default appointing authority in the World Bank and, and these um, AADP, most of these it goes to the ICJ president for some historic reason. Uh, but as I said, the Chinese instruments are primarily uh, Chinese law and CETA. Let's go down. So I tried to summarize uh, it, it, what my own analysis of the comparison between these instruments. I'm not going to go into the details of uh, this, and, and I have a forthcoming article that will show all of this uh, uh, combined. 
but just some of the, the differences and the similarities are just outlined in the slide and I want to go to the next one. I'd like to emphasize that, uh, you know, uh, the broader conclusion that I come to is the Chinese loan instruments are really not extraordinary in any in any way. You have the same types of issues with all these other uh, lenders, uh, you know, the World Bank, ADB and others, as they, in this theory that China or Chinese lenders um, seize assets in Africa uh, and, and and there's all sorts of stories that, that, that run around. But if you look at the instruments themselves, I have not really found any remarkable difference in terms of how they're structured, how they the, the dispute settlement. It's, you see some of the same things, but the only remarkable thing that I've noticed, as I said, is the China centric kind of uh, selection of law and seat of the uh, well, or the, the at least the institution. The next slide, please. Project contracts. Uh, it's, it's a longer topic. I, I don't have time to go to go over this, but uh, just to briefly, uh, if you look at the instruments, uh, some many of these are confidential, but to the extent that uh, we, we've seen some of them, you have the regular thing like waiver of immunity, arbitration uh, under central rules, ICC, Singapore, third country. It's all over the place. You can't really discern any kind of uh, uniformity across uh, across these instruments. Um, and the next one. And uh, people have studied this arbitration and court litigation. Uh, it seems like local court litigation, <laughs> Chinese companies tend to get involved in local court litigation more so than international arbitration or any international resolution. You go everywhere in Africa, there are Chinese cases pending in, in, in the local courts whether it's labor, with taxation issues, uh, and those have been documented uh, by a lot of authors, so I'm not going to go into the details of it, and Matthew Erie also does, uh, the, cites to some of those studies in his, in his writings, and uh, let's go down. And this one has already been covered. I tried to look at the, the uniform rules, and I, I include this in the paper, and I'm not going to go into the details of it. Uh, let's expedite it a little bit more. The uniform rules, I have analyzed them in the paper. Also, there's some, you know, interesting aspects of it. I think that the, the, the broader point really is what Matthew said earlier about whether they're going to take this thing seriously and, and grow it and uh, or is it going to languish like some of the other institutions that we've seen over the years. Uh, but in terms of its design, it seems really uh, very, uh, very good and could potentially grow if it gets cases. But so far, we haven't seen any meaningful activity except the conferences and the discussions and all that. Let's go down. And there is obviously no time for this. I also tried to cover the CICC. And one interesting fact there is there has been appointments from Africa so that the Africans actually appreciate that and I've heard a lot of uh, things about that and uh, you know that also we will see how uh, how it will evolve in the coming years and decades and uh, let's go down. And there's jurisdiction and all that I'm not going to go over it but uh, there's. Uh, uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, let's skip this one in the interest of time again. Let's go down. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take a, a, a minute to to just conclude what I was trying to do. So if you look at from every sector of you know economic activity, whether it's trade, whether it's investment, project, contracts, loan instruments. So there is something that is fundamentally different when it comes to uh, China-Africa relations or the relationship between Chinese companies in Africa. And that is, in my own observation over the years, there is less dispute of any type 
that is referred to international arbitration or any kind of international format resolution compared to the scale and complexity of Chinese investment in Africa. So it's hard to say what that fundamental difference is, except perhaps in a very broad context, we might want to say it's probably culture in, in, in it's, you know, I've had discussions and you know, studies and all of that, and there's almost no doubt that the culture of avoiding formal resolution uh, plays a role and and that is what I can I can say in terms of in, in terms of but I don't know the extent of it and um, but it is obviously so, so as I said earlier when in in 2011 I published the, 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 the main the, my main book I expected a, a very exponential growth of uh, China Africa disputes whether it's investment commerce or other types and that did not occur. And, and it, this requires studies as to how they were avoided and why. And I'd like to conclude with that and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Juan, for the um, great presentation and very detailed and nuanced picture of China's investments in Africa, especially through those detailed analysis of those um, dispute resolution mechanism in the loan agreement project contracts. And for your question of, you know, why we still don't see the significant growth of those disputes, could culture be one of the reasons? So, and that actually leads to my presentation, which I will try to address some of those um, reasons why that leads to China's informalism. So now I move to my presentation, which I will focus on China's use of informalism in the dispute resolution uh, in the BRI. OK, so I'm using this um, file um, trying to illustrate China's use of informalism and uh, through this adapted dispute tree model to capture the legal um, pluralism in which disputes will proceed simultaneously along with coexisting paths, and which also reflects this living and involving nature of disputes. So I start by defining the concept, um, the model of dispute tree. The current theory on informal justice tend to take on board this extension of power beyond the state. But the Chinese informalism, on the other hand, is paradoxically state-led. So instead of being an alternative to formal court proceedings, mediation and other informal measures has always been an essential and integral part of the dispute resolution mechanism in China. It's not always more efficient than formal court proceedings, but it's preferable from the authorities' perspective because it preserves social harmony, and preempt conflicts from escalation and from individual perspective because it maintains relationship and avoids loss of face. In the context of BRI, China's reliance on informalism is reflected by the importance of soft law, usually through the memorandums of understanding and flexibility in the BRI primary agreements, the inclusion of um, amicable settlement clauses in investment treaties and also those BRI hybrid contracts, as well as the use of informal state-to-state -state and private negotiations to resolve the dispute when problems arise. Of course, I'm not suggesting this conceptual opposition between informalism, non-law civil society versus formalism, state law and power. The actual picture is more complex and nuanced, as other speakers already illustrated. So the Chinese model represents a more polycentric forms of ordering, which consists in dynamic and sometimes unstable um, spaces of mixed practice that can operate simultaneously. So I'd like to use this model of dispute trade to illustrate this blending of legal order and pluralism in dispute resolution adapted from the Elbison, Edelman and Milligan's um, dispute tree metaphor. Instead of narrowing the um, dispute to a single point at the top, like the pyramid model would suggest, the dispute tree has several branches from a central trunk. And the different branches 
represent a different path towards this dispute resolution. In the Chinese dispute tree, the informalism branch is deeply rooted and remain to play a very significant role to support the growth of the dispute tree. Other branches will include formal judicial means and the more formal ADR in the form of arbitration that we already heard from other speakers. Um, so I will focus on this informalism branch. Um, I'll illustrate the, the traces of informalism in a moment. Now the dispute tree model allows us then to analyze how individuals interact with the tree, which branches they tend to, tree, uh, to choose in order to reach the flowers or fruit. So flower here resembles a symbolic indica of justice, which can be an acknowledgement of responsibility. And the fruit, on the other hand, represents mature remedies, usually in the form of financial compensation. Now, having established the dispute tree, I will now focus on the informalism branch, which also have sub-branches presented in different forms, including negotiation, friendly consultation, high-level talks, mediation, and National Complaint Center, as Mark illustrated. So starting from the treaties, the vast majority of the Chinese international investment agreements indeed include a requirement of an amicable settlement of dispute through usually negotiation or consultation during a cooling off period, uh, which is often a prerequisite to, for investors to start arbitration. And a few of those IAs make a direct reference to mediation or conciliation, such as the china Cambodian BAT, China-Japan BAT mentioned exit conciliation or arbitration followed by consultation. And the mainland Hong Kong SEPA and mainland Macau SEPA also include detailed rules on the use of investor state mediation. China's latest model BIT, Article 13, provides that any disputes between the investor and the state shall, as far as possible, be settled amicably between the parties through consultation, including the application of mediation procedures. Of course, BRI also includes complex web of hybrid contracts involving state-owned enterprises, private entities, and governments um, that one has very detailed um, illustrated. And his excellent work shows that in a lot of those loan agreements, they tend to choose Chinese law and CITEC arbitration. But as I understand based on Wang's publication that those loan agreements also usually contain a friendly consultation clause prior to the use of arbitration. So with um, Zhou Yixiao, we have also attempted to analyze some of the dispute resolution clauses. Um, we found a number of those investor state contracts along the BRI, mostly on the pro uh, project contracts signed between Chinese investors. The majority are Chinese SOEs and the hosting state across Asia, Europe, Africa, and South America. Our sample is relatively small given the confidential nature of those contracts. So we've reviewed about 22 contracts and in 14 of them, the full dispute resolution clause are available. And all of those clauses indeed include an amicable settlement clause and arbitration clause. Nine of them also provide for expert determination. So more specifically, all of those 14 contracts require parties to first attempt to settle their dispute amicably through media negotiation, usually within a time frame of 60 or 90 days. And if no settlement is reached, then they can resort to arbitration. Some contracts also refer to mediation or conciliation. So for instance, in one contract with a Guinea company, it mentioned ICC mediation rule followed by ICC arbitration. Now in the actual practice, some empirical survey or interviews also show that Chinese entities do heavily rely on negotiation or consultation with local government and other stakeholders when problem arise. So as you can see, the chart on the left is based on um, a number of interviews with representatives of Chinese companies investing in Africa's natural resources and infrastructure sector conducted by the International Institute of Environment and Development. And it shows that negotiation emerged as a primary approach to political race management, identified by 31 out of the 44 interviewees. And the chart on the right 
is based on a survey conducted by Beijing Arbitration Commission with Chinese enterprises who has experience in the BRI projects, mostly construction projects. It also shows that negotiation and high-level talks are the most commonly used method of dispute resolution, followed by commercial arbitration and commercial mediation. There are also a few public records of consultation and conciliation proceedings involving China or Chinese investors. In November 2020, a Swiss investor, um, Eugenio Motonoro, filed a formal request for consultation based on the China-Switzerland BIT, which is required as a prerequisite for arbitration. And after that cooling off period, since no settlement was reached, then they also initiated arbitration under the ancestral rule. In another case, a Chinese investor, the Zijing Mining Group, through its joint venture, um, BNL, filed a conciliation proceeding before the exit, attempting to settle its dispute with the PNG government, arising out of the government's decision not to extend this mine list. So conciliation proceedings were filed in July 2020. Around the same time, the uh, Barrick Australia Limited, so the joint venture subsidiary and who is also an investor in the disputed mine, also filed an exit arbitration in August 2020 based on the Australia PNG BAT. According to some uh, press release, Barrick also stated that he continued to advocate for a negotiated solution for the extension of the the mine lease on the terms that will be beneficial to all stakeholders. And a few months later, in April 2021, the Chinese mining company Zijing made an announcement that BNL signed a binding framework agreement with the local government on the future ownership and operation of the gold mine. Subsequently, there's also record the arbitration proceedings were suspended in December 2021, pursuant to the parties' agreements. So it shows that even initiating a formal arbitration, it still does not exclude the parties to attempt settlement and amicable resolution of a dispute. Sometimes it might just be a strategy even for the parties to start or continue their settlement discussions. So here are some other records under exit. So in the exit arbitration against China, filed by a Malaysian investor, the parties have settled. And according to some interviews with local officials, the local government has agreed under the settlement agreement to pay foreign investor uh, 21 million yuan in compensation and also bear the cost of leasing the replacement land. In another exit arbitration filed by Chinese investor, the Beijing Urban Construction Group against the Yemen, um, the parties settled after tribunal rendered a decision in favor of the Chinese investor. So those cases also show that it is common for the individuals to jump from one branch to another. And initiating a formal proceeding does not exclude the use of other informal means. Finally, um, as Mark has already illustrated this, um, you know, the complaint sanction mechanism, which allow foreign investors to resolve the dispute with the local government. Um, there are some official records here in 2006, the local complaint authority in Guangdong province uh, said that received 96 complaints, among which 92 were accepted, 79 were settled. In 2018, a total of 144 complaints and cases were accepted across the country. So that's another form, I guess, of the informalism branch. Now, having said all the different forms of informalism, the next question is then, why do actors choose certain branches? Why do private actors prefer the use of informalism? And why do state back the use of informalist approach for the resolution of BRI disputes? So to answer this question, I'm trying to go down to the rules to look for if there's any cultural explanations. Professor Fei Xiaotong defined the Chinese society as a differential mode of association, as contrast to the Western organizational mode of association. So the Chinese pattern of social organization is like the circles that you see on the surface of a lake. If you throw a rock in it, everyone stands at the center of the circle produced by his or her own social influence. And everyone's circles are also interrelated. Our social relationships spread out gradually individual by individual 
resulting in an accumulation of personal connections. So within such a relational structure, one's web of connection or guanxi is important not just for social, but also for economic reasons. This is also confirmed by Dr. Hofstede's model of cultural dimension, according to which China is scored very high in the long-term orientation compared to its Western counterparts, indicating that people may be more willing to compromise to maintain long-term relationship. In the context of BRI, for the Chinese investors, maintaining a good relationship with the government may be more important than pursuing their legal rights. So some of the Chinese enterprises already express the concerns if they initiate a formal arbitration that might damage their relationship with governments and lose the prospect of future contract, especially in some infrastructure sector, which is particularly competitive. Such reference is also influenced by important social economic considerations. The cause and duration of arbitration can be an effective deterrent, making the fruit too high to reach and only accessible to those with letters, significant resources. Right? So small or medium sized enterprises may not have the resources to reach out to the branch of investor state arbitration, even if the contracts contain the arbitration clause. Well, large SOEs do have the resources to pursue arbitration, but in practical terms, the arbitration branch may lead you to the flower, but not the fruit. So even if you win the award, it may be difficult to enforce the award against the state assets, even with the sovereign immunity clause. Um, so the parties then may indeed prefer to use informalism branch that can lead you to fruit or at least some of the fruit, right? Sometimes we see uh, the resolution of the disputes to renegotiate loan terms, injection of uh, equity from investor, or even takeover of some debts by third party financiers. And finally, when developing, when investing in developing countries along the BRI, Chinese enterprises often do not see law-based strategies as promising because of the general lack of trust in the legal system of the hosting country. So instead of relying on formal laws and formal legal channels, Chinese companies operating in Africa and some other uh, BRI countries mostly rely on connections and relationship with local stakeholders when problems arise. From the authorities perspective, Informalism also complies with the discourse underlying the BRI, which emphasize an ambition to build a community of shared future of mankind. So China's BRI approach is characterized by a partnership-based relational approach featured by pragmatism, flexibility, and accept compromises to maintain good relationship in the long run. So the informalist approach with its search for a flexible and amicable win-win solution is in line with the BRI philosophy of a community of shared future and a win-win cooperative framework. To conclude, the informal branch provides a central support for the development of dispute tree in the BRI context, and there are cultural, social economic, and social political orientations. And I conclude to with the remark that the use of informalism may indeed be in line with this historical evolution of dispute resolution. We see it always start from informalism, right? Before courts were even created, rules were made, parties resolve their dispute informally. Now, with the need for predictability, with more rules introduced, the process is getting more and more formal until it's getting too expensive, too long, too cubansome, too inaccessible or arbitration is also getting judicialized and that's when users may start to seek for informalism again. Um, so I think I will stop here and happy to continue our discussion. So that actually concludes the uh, presentation of our speakers. So I would also be happy to now open the floor for questions from the audience. Um, if you have any questions, you can uh, put it in the Q&A function. So we will try to address them as many as we could. Um, I might start by sort of throwing a question, I guess, for, for all speakers. As we've heard from 
um, different presentations mentioning about establishing of establishment of different institutions, AIAB, ICD PASO, and the China African Joint Arbitration Center. It seems that building this parallel institution is also one of China's strategic tool to enhance its global governance. So do you think those China-led sort of parallel institution will reinforce, substitute, complement, or compete with the existing institutions? I think you're right. I think overall China is trying to build out its own sort of suite of dispute resolution mechanisms, much as other states have done. For example, Singapore, where I'm sitting right now, has been very successful with the Singapore International Commercial Court, the Singapore International Mediation Center, Singapore International Arbitration Center, right? That these have been well established. I think China's, you know, looking at Singapore. Uh, mainland China is looking at Hong Kong. Um, you know, there's conversations also with Dubai and what's going on there. So there, there are these uh, circulating uh, conversations about how to build out a dispute resolution hub, which is which is what um, Professor Mark Feldman has been talking about. You know, I think that the question that the issue that China faces is its credibility uh, gap, right, in terms of whether or not uh, non-Chinese parties are going to be willing to sign on to these mechanisms to resolve their disputes and you know so far we haven't seen a robust embrace of you know say the china national commercial court which has been seen as kind of the you know the standard bearer of the, the bri dispute resolution mechanisms and and china's you know offerings um i think part of the story is covid right so the entire country was basically locked down for three years so that obviously had a huge impact on the capacity of these institutions to take on disputes um but I still think that 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 credibility deficit is a major issue, and you know the 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 concern then is how does Beijing deal with that, or or the local municipal governments? Right now, it's not just the China International Commercial Court, but there are I think twelve municipal level international commercial courts in Suzhou and elsewhere. So you see this logic being repeated in terms of efforts to build out hubs and. And yet, you know, again, we haven't seen this this embrace. So how do you deal with that? One response is, you know, to bring in foreign experts, right? So China's tried to do that through the International Expert Committee under the CICC. But again, they haven't been tremendously active. So we're kind of at this this loggerheads. I think there are conversations in Beijing to try to figure this out. Uh, so we'll see where where we go with it. But it's a it's a really interesting question. Thanks, Matthew, for those remarks. And I might um, have a follow up question based on. So there is a question from the audience. That's a question for Professor Mark Fetman. Um, kind of follow up on this um, institutional building, right? So there is a question like, you know, there might be concerns about, um, you know, politics for those Beijing based institutions. So how, you know, what advantage does it have if compared to Hong Kong based institution? And I have also kind of related question, right? So you mentioned about the AIA, AIAB. Again, given ICSID already has very extensive global enforcement network, right? Mm -hmm. Why would the arbitration users prefer like instruments that might be developed by AIAB? Great. Th thanks so much, Kun. And this very, my comments very much do follow on, on Matthew's comments. So on, on the Beijing institutions, it, it's clearly a challenge that First of all, you need to make sure you're on the radar of arbitration users. And then once you're on their radar, you have to make sure that you have the confidence of arbitration users. And, and so in terms of inspiring confidence, I think there are a few different areas to focus on. One would be rulemaking. Another would be recruitment of talent. Um, and I think a third would be relationship building. So on rulemaking, th this is where if, for example, the ICD PASO, if they really do develop a, a diversified platform offering very efficient integration of, of arbitration, mediation, dispute prevention services, that could be something that, that we haven't really seen in other places. And so that might help to, to get people's attention that there's something new happening here. And, and also I, I had mentioned regional diversity. If you have an institution where the decision makers really are reflecting the region, that, that you have real representation from Asia, that's another way to, to get people's attention and to perhaps inspire confidence. 
but but confidence you need to recruit top talent and i had mentioned that in 2022 icd paso had, had put out a release for recruiting arbitrators and so if they're able to recruit uh top talent the very best arbitrators the very best mediators that that certainly um, will help what one important difference compared to the cicc matthew mentioned the expert committee uh, the experts on that committee, they can certainly play important roles in supporting the dispute resolution, but they are not the decision makers. And, and so I think that's a very important factor for the CICC is that the decision makers uh, will be Chinese nationals. So I, I think for the ICD uh, PASO, if you're thinking about arbitrators who will be decision makers, uh, they will have more flexibility in terms of being able to look globally for the very top uh, decision makers. And then finally, relationship building. Um, here, one example would be the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration has a cooperation agreement with ICSID. I, I think for institutions based in mainland China, uh, entering into those kinds of agreements with well-known institutions like ICSID can, hurt, can certainly help in terms of getting on people's radar and then inspiring confidence. And then Kun, on, on, your, on your second question about enforceability, I think one important difference today, if you go back to the ICSID convention 1965, the New York convention in, in 1965, the New York convention was concluded in 1958. By 1965, the New York convention was in no way mature yet. So, so I think that if the AIB did want to go in the direction of developing their own kind of uh, convention, their own instrument, I think one advantage they have compared to the World Bank in 1965 is that you already have this mature New York Convention network in place. And so in terms of an instrument they might want to develop, they might not need to include what the ICSID Convention includes in terms of developing a global enforcement network. Instead, they could think about simply relying for enforcement, simply relying on the existing network that's available under the New York Convention. Thanks, Mark, for this um, very insightful um, um, thoughts. And I might have then also like again a follow up question, perhaps for one um, that you your research looking at into this, um, you know, dispute resolution clauses in this loan contract, which seem to have clear indicator of the Chinese lenders ability to actually influence those those terms right by imposing on the use of Chinese law and, um, you know, CETAC arbitration. So I'm wondering, since both you and Matthew mentioned about this um, China African, um, so the CA, CAGAC, right? And, you know, some of other parallel institutions, also including ICD PASO, which might appear to have more sort of legitimacy and appear to have more impartiality, because there are a lot of criticize also about, you know, those loan contracts, including CETAC arbitration. So do you think we might see um, that the, the Chinese lenders or other entities trying to impose or using this other institutions that might appear to be more legitimate in the future uh, contract negotiations? Or are they still kind of more less functional, as Matthew mentioned, it's more of symbolic or signaling effects? Uh, I think... Uh the loan contracts will probably be the last set of instruments to um, select a non-Chinese law or a non-Chinese arbitral institution, if I have to guess, because of their sensitivity, because of their you know, the nature of the relationship. It's usually you know sovereign loans, right? And that's what the existing instruments also suggest. What I mean by that is, uh, to the extent that we have access to these project contracts, other types of you know contracts uh, in in Africa, by it, you know, those uh, have a little bit more diverse uh, set of uh, dispute settlement uh, clauses or agreements than the the loan instruments. So if you look at the Chinese Exim Bank uh, models, there are three models that we've noticed. They don't vary based on the other counterpart. They are constant and they enforce them across the board. So it almost seems like that is a matter of policy. <laughs> 
that's what they do. And I understand why that, that could be. So I don't see that changing, in, you know, in, in short order. Uh, but it's not inconceivable that at some point, because of, you know, in Africa, people talk about this, right? The reason why international arbitration has a bad name in Africa is because it was perceived as, you know, an imposition from former colonial powers. Precisely these are the, the kinds of imbalances that people complain about, right? Why do we go to Paris to arbitrate? Why do we go to London to arbitrate? Uh, before, as Mark mentioned earlier, before predominantly Western arbitrators. So this is really the criticism and the applicable law often is, you know, English law, uh, depending on uh, where you are. So if it, it's perceived that China is trying to, you know, is, is actually doing the same kind of, you know, the hierarchy in terms of negotiating powers, and they're trying to do the same thing, that obviously gets some kind of political kind of pushback, but as to when it might change, it's hard to say, and my, my sense is that it probably won't change in short order. And then we have uh, two questions on the chat, which I think is more related to um, Professor Mike Lawlin. Um, one question um, is from my, my colleague, uh, Professor Bonicha. Um, given how rarely mediation seems to be used in vessel state disputes, to what extent do you think China's enthusiasm for promoting mediation is driven by the communicative motive, as um, Professor Eri put it, um, like promoting the idea of foreign investment is a win win undertaking, as opposed to the genuine belief that mediation will be widely used in practice? And then there's a related question, so also from the audience, that conciliation has already been used for a long time. Uh, so indeed, exit. Um, when it's established, right, it, it was actually based on the World Bank's experience in conciliation. They had hoped that we'll actually see more conciliation. To their surprise, there are actually more arbitration cases than conciliation. So the question is that what well, is indeed not very often used has a low success rate. So in that context, how do you see the current push for mediation in ISDS as a more flexible type of non-adversarial dispute resolution? Okay, so I think I'll take the conciliation, uh, the conciliation question first because it's one that I've found really interesting. <clears throat> so, uh, the, the, if you look at the literature, the the literature does not distinguish between conciliation and mediation. Quite often, if you see um, papers that do empirical analysis, for example, they will take conciliation to mean mediation. But in ICSID, these have emerged as two quite different processes. So ICSID conciliation, uh, how it tends to work is what's issued as a non-binding award. It's kind of a neutral evaluation. Now, that wasn't required by the rules, but and when I speak to officials at ICSID, what they say is um, that's how it started. So the first couple of conciliators did it that way, issuing a non-binding award which is not a, not a mediation, a non-binding award, and that's how subsequent conciliators then took every single case. And so the introduction of the exit mediation rules is to introduce a pure mediation process, which wasn't necessarily banned by the previous system, but was just by practice that conciliation had emerged um, as something different. And so certainly in the exit context, exit conciliation and exit mediation are now two quite distinct processes. And so mediation is the facilitated negotiation, and conciliation um, is the uh, is a kind of neutral, more kind of a neutral evaluation. Certainly not by its nature, but by practice. That is how it's developed, and I, and that's a similar uh, point if you look at the Chinese treaties. Like so, I was interested uh, about how they are being translated. How is the how are the terms for mediation and, and conciliation are they the same in Chinese treaties, or are they different? And actually, in the official translation, conciliation and mediation are interchangeable. So it's um. In Chinese treaties, if there is conciliation, it's sometimes um, translated as mediation and and vice versa. So to that extent, um, well, generally they are um, very similar or the same process. In exit, they have developed as being distinct. Um, so the question about uh, whether mediation will actually be used and given how rare it is, I think I would f first of all raise the premise that we don't actually know how rare 
mediation is for investor state disputes. I mean, in, uh, publicly, I think there are only two or three um, actual mediations uh, being used for investor state disputes. But every year for the Singapore Convention Week, we do an event, Sidra does an event, where we invite um, countries or council and lawyers that have been involved in mediating investor state disputes, several of whom have done several. Um, investor state disputes that we just don't know about that are not public. I believe that Frau Kanichka at ICSID is compiling a list or attempting to compile a list of mediations that have actually taken place. On whether it's a, it's a uh, it's driven by communicative motives, I think it probably is driven by communicative motives in part and certainly driven by more an adverse uh, a, a, an adverse reaction to arbitration and not wanting to engage in adversarial mechanisms more than it is an actual preference for this is a process that we should definitely be following and um, i would say that as i think one mentioned that in 2020 there may have been a change in mindset about the extent to which Chinese parties are prepared to engage in investor state arbitration, but we will see if that uh, if that persists. But I think in general, the point holds that it may be just kind of part of a communicative motive, but you would say that Chinese parties do tend to engage more in these non-adversarial informalism as, as what you would describe it, um, than going into an adversarial um, arbitration process. Thanks, thanks Mark for, for these comments. And if I may add quickly on the comments also on the you know, prospect investor state mediation. And interestingly, in the discussion of for instance, civil justice reform in, in Hong Kong's domestic context, uh, so a judge mentioned uh, that it's of course a cliche that you can take a horse to water, whether it drinks is another thing, but the more you take the horse to water, the more likely it is gonna drink the water, right? So, so we already see the increasing incorporation of some of those mediation clauses in the treaty and in the contract. Well, it doesn't guarantee that disputants will use it, but I guess the more opportunity and also like we mentioned the capacity building, like training and also training media investor state mediators, right? The more we give them opportunity, the more likely the disputants might use the investor state mediation as an option. That's also discussed in the ISDS reform, whether that offers a real alternative to arbitration. Um, and we have another question, which I think Wang kind of already alluded to that. Uh, but I wonder um, if one or other panelists might want to stay further on this. So the continued China centricness in the dispute resolution is a source of concern, right? With Chinese law, Chinese institutions, how to mitigate those one sidedness Would the setting up of institutions that do not start with the word China help, right? Like more sort of regional, global or international, would that lend it more legitimacy? Um, I wonder if any speaker want to tackle this question? I don't think the issue is the word China, right? I mean, I, I don't think just changing the name is really going to have that much effect. I think it has to deal with the governance structure of the institution or the mechanism. Uh, so as people know, Beijing International Arbitration Center some time ago had made the move to a more independent uh, governance structure. Uh, Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration has done the same. I think I think the best example is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which Professor Mark Feldman has talked about, right? Which is an uh, international organization. It's not a PRC legal entity. And so I think that makes a, a lot of difference. Now, having said that, of course, China is the largest shareholder of AIB. So it has some, you know, some semblance of control. But I think that really is the issue. So I wouldn't worry about naming so much. I would think about the particular governance structure. Um, that that seems to be the main the main criteria. And Kun, if I could jump in just to follow, just follow Matthew's point. I, I think the AIB really is a good example on this, that if you go back to, let's say, 2014, 2015, th there were a lot of concerns being raised about governance of the AIB and, and the extent to which it might be China controlled. And I think what we've seen in practice is um, a lot more confidence over time. I mean, really over the past several years, that people have come to realize that yes, this organization is based in Beijing, but it's multilateral. It's being run not unlike uh, any other multilateral development bank would be run. So I, I think the AIB is a real model that, that for institutions like the ICD PASO, that they can say that yes, we're based in Beijing, but we're multilateral. And in terms of governance, that's how our decision making is structured. And, and then it's just the test of time that people need to see that over time, the way the AIB has been functioning over the last several years, that that confidence will build slowly over time. Thanks, Mark. Um, so perhaps I will now give Wang and Mark 
my colleague a time for a concluding remarks, and then we'll conclude our discussion. Juan, any concluding comments? Uh, not really. I think it, you know, uh, Matthew and, and Mark uh, pretty much covered what I was going to say in terms of uh, the, your last question. Um, it, it's it's really it's a mix of complicated factors that make the China centric institutions slightly less attractive to outsiders than than the existing traditional institutions in Europe. Um, you know, uh, so I, I don't know what I can add there. It's it's going to be an extremely gradual process to uh, to make them appealing to a broader uh, set of users. Thanks. Now turning back to Mark, um, there's also a question about, you know, the prospect of China's rectification of Convention on Mediation or any other general remarks that you want to conclude. Yes, I can speak just to a little bit to whether they will ratify the Singapore Convention. So China has signed the Singapore Convention. Uh, when I speak to officials as we do for Singapore Convention Week, the concern is that um, that mediation standards in China are, are insufficiently harmonised for the moment to be ratifying the Singapore Convention. So obviously when you ratify the Convention, you immediately mean make these mediated, mediated settlement agreements enforceable kind of in many states around the world. And I think the tendency or the inclination is to, is to kind of harmonise or standardise China's mediation standards internally first um, before then ratifying the Singapore Convention. My understanding is that's the stage um, that they're currently at. Thank you so much. Um, so now we're um, coming to um, towards the end. I would like to uh, really conclude by thanking all of our speakers for their excellent presentations on different perspectives, very insightful uh, research, and thoughtful reflections and thank for all the audience for your engagement and very interesting questions raised and also thank um, the organizers Sibel and Sidra. So I'd like to thank our colleagues from Sidra who is collaborating with us to organize this event, including Darius Chang, Yu Ying Zhang and Wei Lian Yan for their support and collaboration. And also to thank my colleagues from Sibel, including Fion, Hannah um, for the administrative support. Without them, this would not have been possible. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us. So I hope you will stay tuned and hope to see you in some of our future events. Thanks everyone. <laughs>